It's our privilege this evening to have Professor John Stessinger uh, with us. He's a professor of political science at City University of New York at the Hunter College. His topic will be American Foreign Policy After Kissinger, Continuity and Change. Professor Stessinger, as some of you might be aware of, is well qualified to talk about international affairs. By his life experiences, by his educational background, and by his scholarly achievements. Professor Stessinger was born <coughs> in Austria, Vienna. He fled to Czechoslovakia from Hitler on to Russia and lived in China, in Shanghai, for some seven years before finally coming to the United States in 1947. He came to the United States to pursue an educational career at Grinnell College. In 1950, he proceeded to go to Harvard University <coughs> to seek the PhD. Among his distinguished classmates at Harvard University, or soon to be distinguished classmates, were such people as Samuel Huntington, Stanley Hoffman, Henry Kissinger, and Zbigniew Brzezinski. So in this way also, by his experiences with these gentlemen, he's intimately aware of their views of the world and aware of international politics. Finally, in terms of his writing, he has written prolifically, as you're well aware of. The encyclopedic nature uh, of his knowledge of international affairs is evident by the kind of diversity within his uh, writing. He's written on the United Nations. He's written on general international politics. <clears throat> he's written on the subject of war. And finally, he has written on the subject of Henry Kissinger. His book, The Might of Nations, won the Bancroft Prize in 1963 as the best book in international relations. Other notable books that you might be familiar with, uh, in various editions now, the fourth edition, for example, for this one, The United Nations and the Superpowers, it can be called a classic, I think. In addition, such books as Why Nations Go to War and Nations in Darkness, uh, depicting the perceptual problems between the United States, China, and the Soviet Union, are in their own right becoming landmarks in the field. And finally, uh, his most recent book on Henry Kissinger, The Anguish of Power, uh, is already off to a very rapid uh, acceptance and having been published only in September of 1976. So by these various uh, measures, I think that uh, Professor Stessinger is uh, exceptionally well qualified to talk tonight about American foreign policy after Kissinger, continuity and change. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor McCormick, ladies and gentlemen. Coming to Iowa is a kind of homecoming for me. It's really true, and I feel at home here. It was my first glimpse of the United States, and I'll never regret that I spent three years first in Iowa. Uh, it was a generous view of America, which I'll never forget, and coming back here is always good. Not only did I have a good time, I even played some tennis today. <laughs> and uh, it's really heartwarming to see this kind of a turnout. Let me divide my comments here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, into three main segments. First, I would like to talk a bit about Henry Kissinger and his particular views of foreign policy, because he did run our foreign policy for about eight years. And what is interesting about him is that here we have a scholar, an intellectual in a way, who thought for 20 years about the nature of peace, and then he got into power, which is very unusual for a professor, and then put his thoughts into action. There was a transplant at work here from the world of thought to the world of power. And I'd like to discuss that with you for about 10 minutes by way of introduction. The bulk of my lecture, secondly, will deal with those things, those areas, in which I think the Kissinger policies will continue, and then those areas in which I think we shall see some rather dramatic changes and departures. 
from the Kissinger view. And then third and finally, I would like to raise with this audience some philosophical questions about foreign policy, the role of ethics in foreign policy, several other problems which have recently cropped up, to which no easy answers are possible, but which I would like to raise so we can explore them together in a dialogue, in a question and answer period after my exposition is over. And I do hope that you can stay a while after my speech here so we can chat and have a dialogue about it. Let me then begin with Kissinger. I, rem I met him for the first time when we were graduate students together at Harvard. And I remember it quite distinctly. It was the fall of 1950. And some of us had lunch every day, Big Brzezinski, Huntington, and Stanley Hoffman, who are now teaching in the field. And all of us were rather curious to meet Henry Kissinger. We hadn't met him for the simple reason that he usually sat around in the library and rarely emerged from there. But rumor had reached us, rumor had reached us that Kissinger, when he was an undergraduate and senior, had prepared an undergraduate honors thesis of about 400 pages, modestly entitled The Meaning of History. <laughs> That's right. The subtitle of that opus was Reflections on Toynbee, Spengler, and Kant. Uh, Bill Elliott, who was Henry's professor, was so, so intimidated by this that he read the first 100 pages and gave up and gave Henry Kissinger a summa cum laude, highest honors. Now, when we met Henry Kissinger for the first time, we were green with envy because he had gotten a summa cum laude. And anyone who at Harvard College got a summa cum laude did not have to take the doctor's orals which we ordinary mortals had to do. <laughs> so one fine day in October 1950, there appeared Henry Kissinger, who was very lean then and very intense and military looking with a crew cut. And he sat down at the lunch table and we asked him, of course, right away. And Spig Brzezinski, who a conversation with him is like staccato artillery fire. And he asked him, well, Henry, now that you don't have to take your orals, what will you do your dissertation on? And Henry said very calmly, that he intended to do his dissertation on the Congress of Vienna of 1815, which was a peace treaty that was concluded among the victors over Napoleon, Russia, Prussia, Fr uh, Austria, and England. And I remember asking Henry, I said, Henry, what? 1815, haven't you heard of the atom bomb? What are you doing in the political science department? You should be in history. Why don't you transfer? And Henry looked at me with a very long, rather reproachful glance and said what interested him about the 1815 Vienna Congress was the fact that the five major powers at that time concluded a peace that lasted for a hundred years without a major war. And as a political scientist he was interested first and foremost in how peace was made and how peace was kept. And I must say I shut up very quickly when I heard this. <laughs> and then he proceeded to describe the need to study good case studies of peace treaties which actually made it. He said maybe Metternich and Castlereagh had taken some secrets to their graves that we should do very well to ponder if we in the 20th century would like to discover how peace in fact is made. And after a half hour disquisition, during which he ate a huge helping of chicken a la king, he disappeared back into the library <laughs> and wasn't seen again. <laughs> However, three years later, he did come out. <laughs> he did come out with his dissertation completed. And that, in fact, was published not too long ago under the title of A World Restored. A World Restored is a rather remarkable book. I think it's, in fact, Henry's best book. And in that book, he sets forth his insights about the nature of peace. He tries to answer the question how peace is made and how peace is kept. And he comes out with three basic ideas which later became the pillars of his foreign policy, almost literally transplanted from Cambridge to Washington. So let me give you what these three ideas were. He said, first and foremost, a peace to be durable should not be based on victory or on defeat, but if possible on a draw, on a deal, on a compromise settlement. He said, usually a peace without victory is a victory for peace. The fact that Germany was so badly beaten 
in World War I spawned a Hitler and made another war inevitable. But when Catholics and Protestants made peace after the Thirty Years' War at the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, that was a draw. And Catholics and Protestants had been living together since then in relative harmony. So he argued the first insight is that peace depends upon not one side being happy because that means the other side was, will be totally unhappy, but everyone being a little bit unhappy. Because if everyone is a little bit unhappy, no one will be so totally dissatisfied as to overturn the settlement. That was principle one. Prin what did he apply that, incidentally? Anybody? Well, we'll talk, pardon? We'll talk about that a little later. Anyhow, pardon me for running this like a seminar, but it's more fun that way. <laughs> Second, he suggested that if you have to have a war, and if you win the war, don't kill your adversary. Convert your adversary. It's usually more efficient that way. Try, if you give the adversary something of your own, if you give him part of your own good, so to speak, a stake in your own system of order, you can usually convert the revolutionary and make him into a bourgeois. How many revolutionaries over 40 who have a little bit of goods and property remain revolutionaries? Not too many, Henry argued. And therefore, it's a good idea, if you win a war, to be generous to the former adversary. Co-opt him into your own system of order. And this is, in fact, what the British and the Austrians did with France after Napoleon had been banished to Elba and later St. Helena, that they were generous to France. And France, after a few years, in fact, was reintegrated into the European order, from which Henry deduced, don't kill your adversary, convert him, bring him back into the system. And thirdly, when we took courses at Harvard that year, we had a visiting professor who had just published a book called Politics Among Nations. He was Professor Hans Morgenthau, the apostle of the balance of power. And all of us took his course, and Henry was deeply impressed, and the rest of us were too, because Morgenthau talked about the role of Britain and the way the British dealt with quarrels in the European continent. They very seldom asked the question of morality, <coughs> who is right and who is wrong, in a given dispute. They tended to ask the question of power, who is weak and who is strong. And after having made that decision, who is weak and who is strong, the British would support the weaker side, right? In order to restore balance and equilibrium. Regardless of who was right and who was wrong, they supported the weaker side. And by so doing, equilibrium was restored. And therefore, peace was restored because two guys who were roughly even were less likely to jump on each other than two guys who were uneven. From this, Henry deduced that the secret of peace had little to do with justice and morality. That's a very controversial aspect of Kissinger's policy. Had much more to do with stability and balance. Because in an, in an anarchic world, in which you have so many different definitions of justice and morality, in what is right and what is wrong, don't bother me, he says, with these questions. I want to know who is weak and who is strong. I want to create as many areas of equilibrium as possible. And therefore, peace to Henry Kissinger became a kind of bonus that history, that history awarded to those statesmen who balanced most successfully in an anarchic world. Now, those were the three pillars of Kissinger's intellectual wisdom, which he honed and refined over 20 years while teaching at Harvard. And then when he was catapulted into power, he quite literally transplanted those into the world of power. I remember when he got the job with Nixon back in 1968, we had a long talk. And he asked several friends, including me, whether he should take the job. And many of us said, sure, take it, Henry. We thought he one of our professors in the government, which would look very good for us professors. And then he said, you know, again, I see five major powers vying for supremacy. This time, they are not Austria, Russia, Prussia, France, and England, as in 1815. This time, they are the United States, the Soviet Union, China, Japan, and Western Europe. Why can I not, he said, transplant the insights of the diplomacy of the 19th century to the insights of the 20th century? And he set about now quite deliberately and quite consciously to do that. To recapitulate, insight number one, peace by draw, peace without victory. Whatever the cost, avoid an absolute victory between contestants on one side or the other. Where did Kissinger try to do that? In the Middle East, for example, right? 
He tried his damnedest to prevent in the October war that either Israel or the Arabs would win that war. And I'll come to that in a few moments. What about the second principle, the conversion of the adversary? You can't say to the other side, do as I say or I'm going to kill you, if you are talking to the Russians. You'd have to say, do as I say or I will kill both of us, which is not a very attractive proposition. So you try to convert the other side. You make Mr. Brezhnev more bourgeois. You make him into a businessman. You offer him inexpensive wheat. You make him into a drug addict in the sense of offering him American grain and wheat. And once he becomes addicted and Mrs. Ivanovna in Irkutsk is hooked on American wheat, you lower the boom. <laughs> and you say, you will still want American wheat, then stay out of the Middle East. That's fancy language for linkage, you see. In other words, the conversion of the adversary becomes Henry's second principle. You can't kill the Soviet Union. Try to make them a bit more bourgeois. You can't make them democratic, obviously. That's hopeless. But maybe you can make them a bit less revolutionary, a bit more businesslike, and in that sense, a bit more uh, like the West. <coughs> Henry likes to say, for example, when Nikita Khrushchev was here back in 1959, not very far from here. You people are too young to remember this here. In 1959, he visited Mr. Roswell Garst, looking at the corn crop, Khrushchev. And on that occasion, he happened to say, your grandchildren will live under communism. That's your kids, by the way. That's what Khrushchev prophesied in 1959. He said, we will bury you. Well, Mr. Brezhnev was here in 1973. He didn't say, we'll bury you. He said, we want to borrow from you. It was a very different kind of tune. He had already become half a businessman. And that is, in essence, the concept of conversion of the adversary. Now, the third principle. The balancing process. When two guys out there are fighting, support the weaker side, and by so doing, restore the balance. When two guys hate each other, don't get involved with either one of them, play them out against each other, but generally sort of make the stronger know that you like the weaker. <coughs> now, where did he do that? China and the Soviet Union, right? Henry went to China in 71 because we had no relations with China. Knowing that China and Russia hate each other's guts, he knew very well that going to China would antagonize the Russians and which would, which would give Henry more leverage over the Soviet Union. In other words, he became, if you pardon the mixed metaphor, the lady in the triangle. Every time he went to Russia, the Chinese got nervous. And they said, Dr. Kissinger, wouldn't you like to visit your friend Joe and Lai and have a nice talk? Every time he went to Peking, however, the Russians got nervous, saying, Mr. Brezhnev is waiting for you, wants to talk about detente. And in that sense, you see, by never committing himself to one side or the other, playing both out against each other, he enhanced the leverage of the United States over both. And in that way, opened Russia and China to new initiatives by the West. In other words, this is basically his philosophy. Try to have stability. Don't ask too many questions about morality and justice. Try to convert the adversary, if you can. Make him more bourgeois. And when two guys are fighting who don't like each other, try to exploit it for yourself by enhancing the leverage over both of them, by supporting the weaker side, restoring balance, and playing them out against each other, which he did with, what he did with China and the Soviet Union. In other words, for the last eight years, this guy has run around the world creating as many areas of stability as possible. Equilibrium between Russia and the United States, equilibrium between Russia, China, and the United States, more or less even-handedness between Arabs and Israelis, and in his last year, kind of balance between blacks and whites in Africa. And sure enough, 1976 was in fact the first year since I was a boy in 1939 when the Second World War broke out that we haven't seen a major international war somewhere in the world. In fact, you are the first generation sitting here in front of me that I now teach at the City University. That is a generation that is not in the middle of some international war going on somewhere in this world. So to some extent, Kissinger's policy has been a success. The question is, at what price? At what price? And that brings me now to the second part of this exposition, which is really the bulk of it. Let's look now where he has been successful, and let's look where he has failed. And we have to be objective on this. As a teacher, it is my duty to show both sides to you. Now, in this second part of my analysis, which I call continuity and change, <coughs> My major hypothesis, the thesis which I should like to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that Kissinger's major successes have been in the adversary relationships of the United States with the enemies of America, 
he has done very well to tame the enemies. The Russians, the Chinese, Arabs, Israelis, Africans, and there I think essentially his policies will continue with only minor changes in the Carter administration. On the other hand, he has failed abominably with the friends and allies of the United States until sometimes the friends and allies became adversaries. When it, then he began to pay attention again. However, he had an unhappy way in international politics to take friends and allies of the United States for granted, as a result of which the North Atlantic Treaty is in a shambles. The relationship with Japan leaves a great deal to be desired. The relationship with Latin America is virtually ruined and has to be refurbished from the beginning. And the relationship with neutrals is virtually non-existent. And these are the areas where a great number of new initiatives, that's nice, nations in <coughs> darkness, <laughs> where a great number of new initiatives are going to have to be taken in order uh, to bring new life into, at this point, very exhausted relationships. Let me then tick off for you, if I may, first the areas in which you will see continuity. And I will also take the liberty of suggesting what major crisis areas we might expect in 1977 in these areas, and then do the same thing in the areas where I think you will see some rather dramatic changes. Now, as I said, in the area of adversary relations, essentially we shall see continuity. Let's look at those four then. Russia, China, Middle East, and Africa. First, the Soviet Union. Despite the human rights uh, fracas, which I will talk about in my conclusion a great deal more, in essence, and this we must not lose sight of, in essence, the goal of the Carter administration is still detente. It is still to come home with a second stage of the SALT Treaty, of the first stage of which was negotiated by Kissinger. Kissinger, as you know, did negotiate SALT I, which is the mutual agreement not to build an anti-ballistic missile system. SALT II now hopes to limit the number of missiles which each side has to about 2,400 ICBMs, of which about 1,300 can be merved. That's plenty. Still enough to kill each other 100 times over. Plenty of overkill there. And that's not a very attractive thought, but that, in essence, is the substance of SALT II. Now, recently, as you know, uh, Mr. Vance has been in Moscow in order to come up with an idea for SALT II and went further than Kissinger in a proposal to reduce missiles, which I thought was very wise, but was rebuffed by Brezhnev out of hand. We have no evidence uh, that this rejection came because of the human rights emphasis of Mr. Carter, although many of us in the profession feel that it had a great deal to do with it, or else the rejection would not have been that brusque. So we have to say a word about the new <coughs> human rights emphasis. As you know, President Carter does at this point say that human rights and the observance of human rights is of great importance to the United States throughout the world. And he has supported dissidents against the Soviet government publicly. He has come out in favor of Mr. Sakharov, of Mr. Bukovsky. He has said this, which has irritated Brezhnev no end. However, and this is where the weakness of this morality policy lies, he has tended to single out the Soviet Union and a few weak fascists like Idi Amin in Uganda. But he has not said very much about some of our, a little, shall we say, unsavory allies in the West who have been equally notorious violators of human rights. And I refer to South Korea, I refer to Chile, I refer to Brazil and to Iran, which are all strategically vital allies of the United States. Now, I would assume that if you're going to be really moral, you have to be moral across the board. You cannot practice morality selectively and to leave your friends out of it or sort of wink an eye at them and not to say anything to the South Koreans who have really been horrendous or to the Shah of Iran who engages in torture against dissidents or the Brazilians or the Chilean junta or just to single out the Russians. So therefore Brezhnev has correctly charged that this is a kind of selective morality and how would we feel in the United States if he began to say, how about cleaning up your racial problems in Mississippi and Alabama? How about your Vietnam War resistors? In other words, the problem here is, up to what point can you go before preaching morality to an adversary power becomes counterproductive? It's an interesting question. And I have the feeling that maybe Carter, 
in his newness in the job, may not quite yet have understood the delicacy of this problem. Now Kissinger, maybe on the other hand, went too far toward amorality. He never said a word. For example, I'm having, uh, being a Jew and interested in Jewish emigration from Russia, I know how Henry handled the Jewish emigration problem from Russia. He went to Russia and, were boar and went boar hunting with Brezhnev. Can you imagine Henry Kissinger boar hunting with Brezhnev? <laughs> he did. They usually rounded up a boar for Brezhnev, who's not a very good shot. When he got within 100 feet of the boar, he heroically shot him. And then when Brezhnev was in a good mood, Henry came up with a list and said, hey, Leonid, I got 70 Jews here on this list. Would you please let him out? And Brezhnev said in a good mood, Harosho, they can go, take him away, but let's not talk about it publicly. And this way, Henry quietly got 35,000 Jews out a year from Russia. Pretty good. Then Henry Jackson got into the act. Remember him? <laughs> and he said, morality, he said, no trade agreement, no economic agreement with the Russians unless they sign on the dotted line that they will let out so and so many Jews a year from Russia. Brezhnev told him to go to hell. And since then, Jewish emigration from Russia is down to 17,000 a year, exactly half. In other words, unless you are careful with this crusading business, it can boomerang right back into your face. So I suggest maybe one should not be altogether quiet about it the way Henry was, but one should not alternatively make international agreements dependent upon internal changes within an adversary with whom you're negotiating. Because his ego is gonna get involved, he's gonna kick you out. And you probably can't have it both ways. And maybe, Mr. Carter, wants both detente and internal changes in Russia, and I don't think he's gonna have to be able to take it both ways. I don't think it'll be possible. But I bide my time, and I hope I'm wrong on it. At any rate, the SALT II Treaty is still <coughs> uppermost on our agenda with the Soviet Union. Next point, China. As you know, for 23 years, we had no relations with China. I taught a generation of students who knew more about the moon than they knew about China. They had seen the moon on TV, but they had no idea about the geography of China. Since 1971, you are the first generation again which can read good materials in English about mainland China. A whole student generation before you had an intellectual blackout about it, nothing. Since then, we have a fairly amicable relationship with the People's Republic. American tourists go there, get themselves acupunctured. Things at this point are not exactly normal, but they are more or less less hostile. We don't have full diplomatic relations. We have liaison offices. My prediction is that this fairly low level of relationship will probably continue undisturbed. The main stumbling block, of course, is Taiwan. And I don't foresee any crisis over Taiwan for the simple reason that nature will take its course. The present population of Taiwan consists of 15 million people, about 13 million of whom are native Taiwanese, and 2 million are Chinese, who had come from Taiwan in 1949 with Chiang Kai-shek fleeing from the communists, having taken an oath that they would reconquer the mainland. Well, that was almost 30 years ago. This army is getting very, very old. <laughs> Another 10 years, they're going to hit the pension lists. And at that point, the Taiwan problem will probably become a non-problem. And some ambiguous Chinese formula will be found to sort of bury it ambiguously. And when Henry visited with Zhou Enlai back in 71, he said to Zhou Enlai, you know, I don't know what to do about Taiwan. Why don't we postpone it for a generation? And Zhou Enlai said, you know, Mr. Kissinger, that's exactly what I wanted to propose. You have a Chinese mind. And that's exactly what they did. And there is no indication that this administration will deviate from that decision. So I don't expect anything dramatic in our relations with China. Next, the Middle East. Henry got himself involved in the Middle East in the October War of 73. Remember? And in the middle of that war, he was accused by the Jews to be too pro-Arab. He was accused by the Arabs to be too pro-Israeli. In truth, he was pro-equilibrium. That's Henry, pro-stability, nobody wins. Let's have a stalemate. He switched sides three times in the middle of the war. First, he, won, he warned Golda Meir of Israel not to attack first. Then, when Syria and Egypt attacked and Israel was fighting for her life, he helped the Israelis, but not too much. A few tanks, a few planes, not enough to turn the war around. And when Moshe Dayan really did turn the war around, he helped the Egyptians again and forced the Israelis to let 100,000 Egyptians out from a lethal trap near the city of Suez. And on the 17th day, the war was over. Both sides pooped out and roughly even, which is exactly what he wanted. 
It was in the context of this stalemate that Henry began what he called the step-by-step -step approach to peace. The step-by-step -step approach is a kind of hurdle race. Each hurdle gets higher as you go along. I know it's a little tough to think of Henry Kissinger as a hurdle racer, but uh, he had four steps. The first one, it, was all, it all had to do with return of the territories which the Israelis had captured in the 67 war, you remember. They captured five pieces of real estate from three Arab countries. They captured Gaza. Able to carry off, actually, a typical Kissinger deal over Sinai in 1975 between Egypt and Israel. It was a typical Kissinger deal in the sense that no one was happy. But no one was unhappy either. And to this day, they don't know how to improve on it. The deal was that the Israelis gave back a couple of mountain passes and an oil field. The Egyptians, under Sadat, signed a limited three-year non-belligerency agreement. Henry dished out $2 billion to the Israelis and $1 billion to the Egyptians. Also, 5,000 UN soldiers were interposed in the middle and 200 American radar technicians were inserted between the hostile armies. And this so-called Sinai Agreement is still in force. Then Henry went on to the second case, Syria and Israel over the Golan Heights. Like a rug merchant, he bargained with President Assad of Syria. I saw this, a big map spread out, the Golan Heights, which he called the Seven Hills of Henry Kissinger. And <laughs> Assad was willing to take back three and lead let the Israelis occupy three, and maybe one of them, the most controversial one in UN hands with the Austrians up there playing gin rummy. And this was the deal. <laughs> then Henry went back to Jerusalem, and there the shuttle crashed because you had many forward settlers from the Israeli Likud party, which is the war party, who had representation in the Israeli parliament, who were settled on the Golan Heights and who couldn't be moved. And therefore Rabin, who now has his own problems in Israel, was unwilling to give back anything of the Golan Heights, and as a result of which, the shuttle crashed uh, in late 1975. As a result of which, Assad of Syria got together with Arafat of the PLO temporarily, and the United Nations, under the leadership of radical Arabs, passed an Orwellian resolution in November of 1975 that equated Zionism with racism which made the United Nations a highly unpopular organization for very understandable reasons in the United States. I remember I gave a speech in a, in a state not too far from here on the UN about a year ago, and an elderly lady got up and said, don't you think there are too many foreigners in the United Nations already? <laughs> and uh, that was a rather serious question. <laughs> At any rate, in 1976, Henry more or less gave up on the Middle East and began to shuttle around in Africa. And from the Israeli point of view, from the Israeli point of view, had a deus ex machina, because Israel's two worst adversaries, the Syrians and the PLO, were massacring each other, all here in Lebanon, if you will remember. So when the, at the time that Henry left office, in early, early this year, the Israelis thought they wouldn't be pushed anymore because the Lebanese war was killing off the Syrians and the Palestinians, and maybe the Israelis could hang on to what they had conquered in 1967. In the meantime, Henry and the Israelis did not get along very well with each other because the Israelis perceived Henry as putting on the pressure on them. There were many stories about that. Uh, Nixon, as a matter of fact, this comes from a rather impeachable source, had a uh, good relationship with Golda Meir. And at one point, the story goes, uh, he is said to Golda, you know something, Madam Prime Minister? We have something in common now. We both have Jewish secretaries of state. And Golda said back, uh, that's true, Mr. President, but mine speaks English without an accent. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, you like that. Okay, I'll tell you another one. After Henry left office, the Israelis made all kinds of jokes about it. Now they're already getting nostalgic for him to be back because they know the pressure is going to be on again. And the story went that after he lost office, he got so frustrated that he put on 20 pounds. And he had to have a new suit made. So he went to his favorite tailor with a wonderful piece of material. And the tailor fingers it in Washington and says, beautiful. Uh, I need a suit, says Henry. Taylor says, it's lovely material, but it's not enough for a suit. I can make you a pair of pants, I can make you a vest and a jacket, but not for a whole suit. Henry grabs the material, goes to his other tailor in Paris, in Rome, in Bonn. Same answer, not enough for one suit. Finally, Henry winds up in Tel Aviv. Little Jewish tailor in back alley looks at this beautiful material, says, Dr. Kissinger says the little tailor, it's beautiful material. How many suits do you need? And uh, <laughs> wait a minute, this isn't over yet. 
So Henry says, what do you mean, how many suits do I need? The other tailors couldn't even make me one. You can make me more than one. How many can you make me? Little tailor says, I can make you at least three. Henry says, how come you can make me three suits when the other guys can't even make me one? Taylor says, look, here in Israel, you're not such a big man. And that was <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I could go on like this all night, but I won't. Anyway, so at this point, I predict more of the same, really, under the Carter administration. Uh, I don't think that Carter is going to lean more toward Israel than Kissinger <coughs> is. I don't believe it. Even though before the election he suggested that he might, now it doesn't seem that he will. And I think the approach that Kissinger followed is will be continued. In essence, the dispute between Kissinger and American Jews and Kissinger and Israelis was that many Israelis said, Henry, why did you not let us win the war of 73 the way we won the war of 67? We really beat them then. We could have done it again. Why did you stop us? And Henry said, yes, I stopped you because your victory in 67 made the war of 73 inevitable because the Arabs felt in 67 that where the Germans felt in 1918, they had to make another comeback. That's why I stopped you. An argument which goes into the heads of some of the Israelis, but not exactly into their hearts. Now, there is no evidence that under Carter, Vance, and Brzezinski, <coughs> this attitude is going to change. In fact, the way Carter talks about a Palestinian homeland, the concept which is known as the Brooking Solution, which is probably the return of most of the territories that Israel captured in 67, uh, the rising of an Arab alliance to the northern tier of Israel, the winding down of the Lebanese war, the internal terrible weakness within Israel, an inflation rate, a tax rate, scandals in the Labor Party, an uncertain future within Israel, all point to new pressure by this administration on Israel, which I think will be even stronger than those exerted by Kissinger to the point that many Jews in this country are already longing for Kissinger, which no one ever expected. And I predict that in essence, the Kissinger policy will continue if anything It'll be somewhat less pro-Israel even than Kissinger. Next, Africa. Kissinger, after 25 years of American equivocation over Africa, finally threw the lot of the United States behind black majority rule in Africa. And I think that'll continue under Andy Young, who is already a rather outspoken fellow of dubious representation for the presidency at this point, has made quite a name for himself already or some of his recent statements, a symbol, of course, that at this point the United States backs black majority rule. Now, for 25 years, we didn't. For 25 years, we sat on the fence. On the one hand, we don't like apartheid. We outlawed it in our public schools in 1954. On the other hand, however, over 100 American corporations have large investments in white-dominated industry in South Africa, gold mines, diamond mines, so our heart and our pocketbook are on opposite sides of our body politic. The result, when voting time came around for 25 years, we abstained. We hid under the table. Then Angola happened. Angola went more or less into the Soviet camp. Henry said, hey, wait a minute. A couple of more Angolas, we will destabilize the relationship between Russia and the United States. And stability is the linchpin of my policy. I'm going to Africa and I'm backing black majority, it's the only way to prevent more black African states to go into the Soviet orbit. The only way to do it, and that was the main reason why since last year uh, we are backing black majority rule. Now I think with Carter, it's a more principled stand. It's less Machiavellian than Henry's was, but in essence I see no change from this recent decision to back black majority rule in Africa. I think Namibia will probably make it, by black majority rule within two years. Southern Rhodesia is a 50-50 proposition where the blacks outnumber the whites by 24 to 1. And the way to deal that is to buy out the whites in an Anglo and American consortium, which you and I are going to pay for if it works. And the big problem to which no one has an answer, of course, is South Africa <laughs> herself, where the whites had come there at the same time as the blacks, which is not typical in the sense where the whites came to Africa and superimposed themselves upon the blacks in colonial situations. But in South Africa, you have an Aristotelian tragedy because whites and blacks 
Both have a claim to the homeland, and there the blacks outnumber the whites by four to one. And the problem is, will the whites, who have all this strategic, military, political, and economic power, yield to majority rule by the blacks, which is highly unlikely? And no one at this point has an answer to it. No one. And I don't think it would be fair or appropriate even to suggest that an easy answer is possible, except that much talent by this administration will be spent on the African situation. To recapitulate then, continuity more than change in the adversary relationships with Russia, with China, in the Middle East, and with Africa. Now let's go over to the other side of the ledger, the liability side. Where did my buddy louse up? He didn't do very well in the continent where he was born, did he? Western Europe. Remember NATO, the glorious alliance of the West? What's left of it? Look at it nation by nation, hardly anything, because Henry ignored it. Let's look at it. Canada, separatist problem, Madame Trudeau in New York, big situation <laughs> there. Even the Canadians have problems. The Greeks and Turks, big falling out over Cyprus. The only guy they hate more than each other is Henry Kissinger, who fouled up Cyprus in 1974. The Italians, 38% communist. The specter of a communist country within an anti-communist alliance is not completely illusory. The French not too far behind. London, a refueling stop for Henry Kissinger on his way back from Moscow, the pound falling steadily. The Scandinavian members not exactly too reliable in their contributions to NATO, which is the only country, paradox of paradoxes, in Western Europe, which is the one loyal NATO ally. Which country haven't I mentioned yet? West Germany, that's right. The great enemy of World War II is our one loyal ally, NATO. Henry watched soccer games there. So <laughs> it's not a very wonderful prospect, and it is not an accident uh, that Jimmy Carter sent Mr. Mondale first to Europe and then to Japan to sort of regalvanize that alliance. It is also not an accident that Jimmy Carter and Zbig Brzezinski met on the common ground of the so-called Trilateral Commission, which is a body of people who want to bind together the democracies of the Western world, which they feel correctly have languished under the administration of Ford and Kissinger, because Ford and Kissinger and Nixon and Kissinger pay too much attention to the adversaries. And that, of course, has been a disaster. So much more emphasis, I suspect, will be placed on the Western European allies in this administration. Similarly, Japan. The Japanese really fared rather badly under Kissinger. For some reason, Kissinger didn't like the Japanese. In one unguarded moment, he referred to them as a bunch of Sony salesmen. <laughs> and he was not very tactful about it. In fact, uh, he, f he loved the Chinese. He loved Zhou Enlai, who became a personal friend. And he few flew over Japan to China to change policy without telling a word to the Japanese about it. Naturally, the Japanese government collapsed overnight, and then they had to double up and catch up with their American friends to change China policy. Mr. Nixon devalued the dollar, which ruined the Japanese yen, and to this day they talk in Japan about Nixon shoku, shock, as a result what happened there. Today you have a caretaker government in Japan. For the first time in almost 30 years, the Democrat liberal ruling party in Japan, which is a pro-American alliance party, is in serious danger. And there is a real possibility <coughs> that that country might just go neutral, might get out from under the American defense umbrella because it has been ignored for so very long. So it's not an accident that the Japanese prime minister recently was wined and dined by Jimmy Carter, that Jimmy Carter, in fact, in every other speech, has talked about the need correctly to refurbish the alliance with the Japanese. Now, the same is true of the Latin Americans. Henry paid no attention to our neighbors to the south. He took them for granted. Good neighbors, bad neighbors, who cares? I got other things to do. He promised to visit four times. It was like waiting for Godot. <laughs> Finally, he went in 1976. At long last, what does he do? He establishes a special relationship with the one big fascist government down there with Brazil, which did not sit very well with those Latin American countries struggling for democracy. And Jimmy Carter, quite appropriately, gave a speech last week in which he talked about the need to observe human rights in Latin America and began to cut off some of our military sales and aid to some of the little dictatorships down there, which is a good idea and might help us balance the budget a little bit. So that, too, I think, will come in for a great deal of overhaul. 
And then, of course, there is the overall failure of Henry Kissinger in Indochina, the complete and utter fiasco of Indochina, where he falsely assumed in 1973 that in a Metternich-type deal of 50-50, Ho Chi Minh would take the North, the Americans will take the South, and we're all going to share a Nobel Peace Prize, that this would last forever. When in fact, the North Vietnamese had perceived the Americans as a bunch of invaders. Henry said 50-50, you take half, we take half. The North Vietnamese said, this reminds me of a bunch of bank robbers who rob a bank and offer to give back half of the loot. And they never really saw eye to eye. So after the Americans pulled out in January 73, it took two years for our situation there to collapse completely. And the tragedy, of course, of Vietnam is that now that we read about diplomatic relations with Vietnam, I bet my bottom dollar that within five years from now, we will probably give them assistance, economic assistance, like we gave to Tito in Yugoslavia for the last 30 years, that one comes to the grim conclusion that 56,000 boys who would love to be alive and make love today are dead for nothing. And I think that is a major scandal which should not be glossed over, not to mention the $150 billion which was wasted. I don't blame Henry Kissinger for escalating the war. That was Johnson, who got half a million of our boys in there. I do blame him for pulling us out much too slowly and via Cambodia, which was not necessary. So, in essence, there is a balance sheet, which is mixed. Nobody's perfect, neither is Henry. <coughs> I think, to a large extent, he has made the world a little safer. We no longer live under the shadow of a thermonuclear holocaust, as my student companions did back in the 50s, when Nelson Rockefeller said there should be a fallout shelter in every American home. And in 1962, we almost went to war with Russia under John Kennedy over missiles in Cuba. These days are probably over. We now have different problems, different priorities. The Russians and Chinese are half tamed. We've taken some first steps toward peace in the Middle East. Even the African situation looks a little bit better. He has done a lot of good. But with our allies and friends, he has not done very well. So on balance, I would say, he has left us a world somewhat safer than the one that he entered, but not necessarily too much better, maybe a little bit better. Now, with this said, let me pass on to my concluding comments in the third part of this lecture. And this has to do with some philosophical questions which I would like to raise with you here and to which no simple answers are possible. The first one has to do with the role of ethics in a world of power, which was really raised by the Kissinger administration and which is now doubly accentuated in the human rights <coughs> emphasis by Jimmy Carter. What, if any, is the role of justice and morality in foreign policy? In the American tradition, we have two extremes on this. We have, on the one hand, Kissinger, who is a product of the European philosophical tradition, Hegel, Bismarck, Machiavelli, who says, don't bother me with morality. I'm interested in stability. If I get stability, I get peace, and that's my morality. On the other hand, you have the Calvinist American Puritans on the other extreme. He says, you've got to have morality, and moreover, you've got to preach it like Dulles 20 years ago. Dulles, who said to the Europeans under the Soviet yoke, he said, I will roll back the Iron Curtain. We must have a policy of liberation from the Iron Curtain. Some of you may remember this. Then what happened? The Hungarians rose in 1956 and said, hey, help, the Russians are coming. Dulles says, oh yeah, I only meant moral support. And the Russian tanks came in. In other words, if you're gonna be moral, you have to back it up or else you're gonna look like an idiot. And that's the problem, you see. So the two extremes are not particularly attractive. The amorality of Kissinger and the crusading morality of Dulles are not are equally unacceptable. I remember asking Henry once, when we were students together, I said, Henry, if you had to make a choice between justice and order, which would you pick? So he gave me an answer from Goethe, the famous German poet, and he said, if I had to choose between justice and disorder on the one hand, and injustice and order on the other, I would always choose the latter. And that's Henry Kissinger. Now he believes, that morality in foreign policy is a relative proposition, which means that you can never choose between right and wrong. You are forced to choose when you're in that particular hot seat between one right and another right, or sometimes, what's even worse, between one wrong and another wrong. How do you choose, for example, in the Middle East? 
the Arab and the Jewish peoples, both having discovered their national destinies at roughly the same time, roughly the same place, appealing to God, to righteousness, to reason, and to law, no one can say that one has necessarily a better claim than the other. They both have a claim, and yet choices must be made. Therein lies what I call in my book the anguish of power, the need to choose between rights, the need to choose between wrongs. And as Camus once said, the great French existentialist philosopher, not to choose also is a choice. You cannot simply abdicate responsibility by refusing to make choices. Now, this became clear, I remember, back in 71. Uh, I had an argument with Henry over India and Pakistan, when India and Pakistan went to war over Bangladesh. And in those days, as you may recall, Pakistan was allied with China, and India was allied with the Soviet Union. And Henry, in his typical way, said, don't bother me who's right and who's wrong. I want to know who's weak and who's strong. And of course, Pakistan was allied with China, India with Russia. So on the scale of power, Pakistan and China was the weaker. So we tilted that time toward Pakistan and China. But by tilting toward Pakistan, we got ourselves involved with a lousy dictator whose name was Yahya Khan, who had killed off two million Muslims in East Pakistan, later Bangladesh, and had chased another eight million into exile. And I said, Henry, how can you get into bed with this guy? He's a very unattractive character. Why don't you tell him to go to hell? So Henry said, if I really told him to go to hell, if I dropped Pakistan at this point, the government would collapse, and the Indian-Russian juggernaut would overtake the entire Indian subcontinent, and that would be the greater evil. In other words, to Henry Kissinger, morality is morality of the lesser evil. In a difficult world, we must choose, he argues, between unsatisfactory possibilities, the less unsatisfactory. Now, many native-born Americans can't buy that. They like to believe that there is a clear-cut right and a clear-cut wrong, and that we must choose the right, the children of light, as Niebuhr said, over the children of darkness. Maybe, maybe not. I don't have an easy answer to this, but I invite you to ponder it. I invite you to ponder how many times in our personal lives we face clear-cut choices, and how many times even in our personal lives we must choose between wrongs or between rights. And it's even much more so in foreign policy. The second problem has to do with ego. How much does personality play a role in foreign policy? How much, for example, did Henry Kissinger's big ego make a difference, for better or for worse? To what extent will this change in style under Cy Vance? Well, Henry Kissinger does have a big ego. I remember back in 68, when he worked for Rockefeller for the short-lived uh, pitch for the presidency, he m wrote most of Nelson Rockefeller's speeches. And in those days, Henry's prose was very Teutonic, long sentences with a verb on the next page. <laughs> so Rockefeller secretly hired himself a couple of Anglo-Saxon editors with crew cuts who were going to clean up Henry's heavy prose. And Henry, who found out about everything, <coughs> discovered this, found out about it, and one day stormed into Rockefeller's office and said, Nelson, when you buy yourself a Picasso painting, do you hire yourself two house painters to improve on it? <laughs> this is Henry's ego. Utter contempt. Now, on the other hand, uh, Henry was very vulnerable. He was a Jewish refugee uh, whose big ambition when he came to America was to become an accountant before he went to night school at CCNY, but then he met a, met a monocle German uh, in the American army, a certain Fritz Kramer, who said, gentlemen, do not study in New York City. They go to Harvard. So Henry went to Harvard. Otherwise, you'd never have wound up there. He has nothing but his mind. In essence, he is his mind, in a sense. And therefore, he always interpreted attacks upon his ideas as attacks upon his person. He was never able to make the distinction between his ideas and his personality. His brilliance is only matched by his vulnerability. Now, Vance is a very different guy. He will take the bureaucracy much more into his confidence. He's a team worker. No doubt the Department of State will have much more to do with policy. Under Henry, when Henry went to the Middle East, everything stopped. But Henry formed personal relationships with every Arab leader, and that was very valuable. Vance will have to do that, too. Every little sheik wanted to talk to Henry. And similarly, now they will want to talk to Vance. And in that way, since in the Middle East so much depends on personal relationships, that was very valuable. So I would say don't necessarily just condemn Henry for his over-acceptance 
of ego and personality, it also had a good side, and I think the good side manifested itself in the Middle East. Although it is true that Henry was unable to delegate anything to anybody. And as Shakespeare once said, when sorrows come, they come, in si they, they come not single spies, but in battalions. And sometimes there, were, there was just one crisis too many. In 1974, he had Middle East, he had Vietnam, he had Portugal, he had Watergate, and he had Cyprus. And Cyprus was one too many, so he fumbled it and really ruined it. And he waggled his finger at the Portuguese, invited them to the State Department, and said, don't have any communists in the government. He talked to the foreign minister of Portugal, Mario Soares, and said, you remind me of Alexander Kerensky, the forerunner of Lenin. And uh, Soares said, what? I don't want to be like Kerensky. And Henry said, neither did Kerensky. <laughs> and that was it. So, you know, he was a bit of a, uh, a preacher that way. But um, the question of ego is also a double-edged sword. Again, I have no final answer to that problem. Finally, before I subside, and it's about time that I should, both Kissinger and his successors are obsolete, perhaps, in one very fundamental sense. And that is that both Carter and Zbig Brzezinski, as well as Kissinger and Ford, and before him Nixon, saw the world essentially divided between East and West. The major conflicts, they said, in our world are between communism and anti-communism. I'm beginning to think now, after being at the UN for many years and looking around the world, that this is beginning to change. That in many ways, the major cleavage in the world that your generation will have to cope with will be the cleavage between North and South, between whites and non-whites, alas, between rich and poor, between consumers and producers, between haves and have-nots. And, not, and this administration and the previous administration have not paid enough attention to it. I'm no longer worried, really, that we're going to have a nuclear war with the Russians or with the Chinese, as I worried 20 years ago. I think we have really survived that, hopefully. What I worry about now is terrorism, terrorist attacks coming from within the cracks of the nation-state system, self-styled patriots, liberation fighters, even idealists, or just plain criminal gangs and maniacs who ha have access to uranium-235 and fissionable material. The combination of abject poverty that you find in the so-called third world, to which Henry paid no attention, and to which Mr. Carter has not yet begun to pay attention, the combination of abject poverty there, coupled with easy access to technology, is a lethal combination. As I mentioned in one of, my, one of the classes here this morning, I had a student a year ago at Princeton where I was a visiting professor. This guy came from the physics department. He had done a term project. The term project for which he got an A was the building of an atom bomb, a Hiroshima-type atom bomb, a little one. Kills only 100,000 people. Now, if a Princeton undergraduate, based on public knowledge, can build himself an atom bomb, how long will it take before dispossessed people from the new nations of the third world, furious, at the deprivation which they have suffered for hundreds of years, can do the same and can say, I want food for my people or else I'm putting a bomb in a locker room in New York and the city goes up. Now this is the kind of scenario that is much more likely today than a thermonuclear war with Russia and with <laughs> China. And to that we don't have an answer yet, except we have to address ourselves to the problem of north-south relations at least as much as relations between east and west. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, foreign policy and the building of a foreign policy is always a struggle. A struggle in which, in the end, you don't come out with any finite victories. You don't come out, hopefully, with any finite defeats either. But you leave your work unfinished, whoever you are, and the main thing that you get is the struggle, the process itself. And sometimes, and I'd like to end on this note, when I worked as <coughs> director of the political affairs division in the UM, in my darker moments, I wondered, as many people wonder, who are in public affairs, what good does all this do? What difference do I make? Will I leave any impact? What does all this work really mean? Shouldn't I go out and play tennis and let the world go by? All of us in the field have moments of this kind who write in the, and labor in the vineyards of international politics. When I have these darker moments, I'm encouraged by one story, which I read many years ago when I read Camus. Camus is one of my favorite philosophers, the existentialist Frenchman who wrote during the Second World War. 
He wrote a little story, which is only a few pages long, which is called The Myth of Sisyphus. Now, Sisyphus, as you all know, is that allegorical Greek figure who was condemned in Hades to roll a rock to the top of a mountain, except every time the rock reached the summit, it rolled right down again into the valley. And Sisyphean labor, therefore, has always come to mean useless, futile, endlessly meaningless labor. Now, along comes Camus, a child of the Second World War, and extracts some optimistic meaning from this pervasive pessimism of that ancient myth. He says, when I think of Sisyphus, I do not think of him straining upward to the summit of that hill against his rock. I think of him going down into the valley when he's free of his rock, plotting the next assault upon his fate. That, Camus wrote, is his moment of freedom, his moment of consciousness when he's stronger than his fate. And therefore, Camus wrote, I consider it a privilege to be engaged in the struggle itself. It is in the engagement, in the commitment to the struggle, that we must find our satisfaction. And therefore, because Sisyphus was so engaged, I considered him a happy man. Therein the paradox, the possibility, that even Sisyphus might not have been totally unhappy. And in many ways, within that paradox is the problem 